Good afternoon. I greet you all who joined us at Media Center Ukraine, Ukraine Forum. We start our work, and today is a very important meeting, uh, ninth year of war and uh, 168th uh, day since the full-scale invasion of Russian aggression to our land. So the challenges that we faced uh, with this war we will speak about uh, those challenges and the topic of our conversation is uh, uh, registering uh, war crimes and uh, 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 making uh, criminals responsible, uh, speaking about the victims of uh, Russian aggression, those who suffered from it, and uh, support and communication with families of uh, perished, of uh, POWs and uh, of those who are missing. So today, well, we have representatives of NGOs, of international foundations, and also representatives of uh, the different uh, institutions of authority, of state, state authorities. Uh, and I would like to introduce our speakers today. Oksana Kalida, head of the projects of Geo uh, Prostor of Mezhelusti, Olga Halchenko, International Foundation Vidrogenia Renaissance, Lech Kotenko, representative of Office of Author, uh, Commissioner on uh, Missing People. Andrei Yusuf, coordination uh, staff of uh, issues of uh, handling the POWs. Volodymyr Lamzin, head of Central Administration of Civil Military Cooperation of General Staff of Armed Forces. Director of Department of Ministry of Veterans, uh, Ruslan Prikhodko. Olga Rashitilova, uh, founder and coordinator of uh, the Initiative for Human Rights. Adana Lunyova, advocacy director of uh, Center of Human Rights, uh, Zmina. And also we have our two participants online. I still do not see them, so I hope we will add them. That's Daria Sveridova, member of the Commission on uh, Legal Reform under President of Ukraine. And Nadia Volkova, director of Ukrainian Legal Advisor Group. So, without further ado, we'll start our conversation. Uh, Iksana, I will give you the floor. Please tell us why we gather today and why this topic is so important and sensitive. Please. Good day, everybody. My name is Iksana Kolida, and I'm the project director of the organization of uh, Prostor Majilisti, and uh, I represent a coalition of uh, space of veterans. I can tell you that all veteran spaces are uh, online. It's more 20 than 20 centers to support veterans and their families and families of missing people or POWs that uh, those centers support them daily. So for them, it's very important to hear what we will be talking about. They write questions to me and in the end of our session, I uh, will ask them. I want to say that the war is people, our defenders, that defend us in the front line, and uh, it's the families, and families of those who perished, and those who are missing, and those who are captive, and uh, the authorities and state institutions, and uh, legal organizations and NGOs, they have to communicate with those people on what is happening. What are we doing to support them with all means possible to find the relatives, to bring, sometimes bring the bodies to bury, because we know the uh, war ends when we uh, return our last hero home. And we initiate this uh, meeting and we want to hear what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in our country, what the authorities are responsible for, how they coordinate between each other. And it's important for us, uh, for NGOs and for the organizations that operate in regions. And that's a difficult communication. But without it, indubitably, we cannot do without. Therefore, the framework of this project with the Renaissance uh, Foundation, we want to continue it. And uh, this event is devoted to this importance of that communication with people. Ms. Olyo, uh, please uh, tell me of your participation in this process. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Olga Galchenko. I represent National Renaissance Foundation uh, Program of Human Rights and uh, Justice. The idea is to bind one plat discussion platform, veterans, veteran community, and uh, 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 attorneys, uh, 
it was happened uh, yeah, last year before the full-scale invasion in the next round of uh, war so we uh, the purpose was to join uh, veterans and attorneys and to speak about uh, Rome Institute about national humanitarian right about uh, war crimes about deoccupation of reintegration and uh, of uh, the transition uh, justice because we see in veterans some moving force in these processes we just did not th estimate how much force that is so the start was uh, last year uh, it was more a theoretic discussion uh, so if we actually deoccupy territories and how that will happen how reintegration will happen uh, however now after um, full start of full-scale invasion it's a paradox because we have more occupied territories and the scope of task uh, is bigger but it's a paradox we have a feeling that this deoccupation will happen and all the theory that we were discussing last year uh, we will be prepared to implement it in practice and uh, that feeling uh, became stronger and this deoccupation is happening we just have to spit it up and move to from theory to practice and it would be very interesting to hear the state what does the state do and uh, the veterans and attorneys how we can be uh, helpful and how what roles we can play the veterans and uh, the, the attorneys uh, in the rear not all all the attorneys are in the rear there are uh, there are the front line as well and the civil society how we can help the state in this very difficult and very uneasy issues that we'll discuss like please you maybe take the floor and start the conversation from the start from the state we understand the challenges that uh, the state faces since the start of full-scale invasion we understand that they were uh, back in 2014 but with the start of full-scale invasion they um, scaled up drastically so uh, what are you doing now what challenges you face and what problems and uh, it's very important as Olga said to understand how civil society can help you how volunteers can help you how those who are willing to help can help you good afternoon dear colleagues i'm alec katenko uh, commissioner on uh, issues of missing people on special uh, circumstances war is also special circumstances uh, so the state cares because of uh, searching for such people that uh, are missing firstly you emphasize that in 2014 I was a head of uh, Patriot Group uh, NGO. I was looking for missing people and uh, um, freeing the POWs. And uh, so I know this work and I, I've been working in this field for a long time. So when I took this position, I did not have things that I didn't understand really. I understood what, what, what to do and how to do it. To that end, the Secretariat was created uh, in the Commissioner's Office. Uh, it's comprised of five people and uh, we're finishing up work on creating the coordinational centers that will be in each uh, region work in each region and i think pretty soon they'll start operation and this will be as you say how we can communicate with the civil sector with civil society how they can help actually uh, the coordinator is a very responsible role it's communicating with relatives of missing people also it's communicating with uh, state authorities uh, to be able to help people who need help in the regions where uh, they are and uh, search and rescue groups uh, where, where they're needed on the front line or Mikolaev, Zaporizhia, Donetsk region, Kharkiv where the uh, the combat happened happened uh, and uh, so much in the Kiev regions the rescue the search groups will work there and together with the general staff or the armed forces who work in that and we cooperate with the coordination uh, staff that was created and was is headed by Kirill Budanov and they will speak more of themselves but I think I consider that unless we unite to solve those issues we as a state it will be diff very difficult f later to do anything when 
we won't be bond, uh, united and we won't have a single goal firstly to win over the enemy and then to find the missing people because we add each other it's not by a hundred percent works uh, but it, it does work volunteer organizations work with us uh, activists work with us uh, volunteers work work with us and they really help us in our work uh, that we fulfill also all state bodies that uh, we communicate with they help us really and this improves the speed of uh, our search of missing people currently we have we have returned uh, bodies of uh, perished heroes over 500 just yesterday we took 17 bodies of our heroes those who were considered missing many people that we think are missing uh, we just have a connection with them people address but 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 sometimes we find them alive because uh, there is just no uh, no uh, communication with them uh, sometimes people just missing because there's no connection and we don't understand where they are but the a lot of people we find and uh, sometimes we find that they're uh, prisoners of war and uh, our coordination our uh, staff is working to be able to uh, save those people to free those people and uh, thank you for welcoming me here for inviting me here I'm agree to in, involve with such uh, events to explain people what they need to do I think about algorithm of action so I could just speak in a nutshell just uh, for people to understand uh, what to do if uh, somebody goes missing number one is to address the national police with the uh, request about missing person application for missing people if a police wants to take DNA, give them DNA. It does not mean anything. It does not mean that the person has perished. But there is a procedure. It's a procedural issue. Step two uh, is you have to address the National Informational Bureau, NIP. Uh, 1648 is the hotline uh, number. 1648. Probably uh, some people uh, who are watching us already had addressed them. For us to be able to account all people that we have no connection with so if we find them uh we t take them from that of that register and i rec also recommend uh, to address the commissioner on uh, missing people to address us uh we have our telephones please zero eight hundred three three nine two four seven and if person is abroad uh, there is a zero nine five eight nine six zero four twenty one there there are messengers and you will be able to call them and people add give you psychological help and will tell you what to do in your situation the operation is ongoing a lot of work really uh, regretfully we cannot do everything at once because we had a lot of uh, talks with the relatives, they scold us, say, well, why didn't you not do this? Why did you not take our uh, relative? Why it goes this way or that way? We are conducting hard work. It's not only our office, all the, all the state to return all our defenders that are prisoners of war or missing. And I want to believe that this will be as soon as possible. I think about captivity, the people will tell you uh, later. But thank you. We were speaking about communication with relatives. Oksana, is you as a representative of the NGO, you know about the problems that arise. What are they? Maybe we can speak through those problems and that communication. You make it efficient, more efficient. We do a lot to make this communication efficient. Uh, and we work with the commissioner office as well we from those uh, um, space veteran space so they agreed the, as coordinators in this regions they they they, uh, they took that niche and i want to say that the civil sector is preparing for that work because it's complicated we conduct training with the help of specialists of a very high level our national center of uh, psych uh, health it's just one one center uh, because people who are daily working with the families of uh, missing people 
uh, and POWs and uh, perished, the uh, people need to training for that work. Of course, we hope that this cooperation with our commissioner office will allow us uh, to have more tools, more precise information. For families, it's very important to receive feedback. So they receive feedback and proper feedback properly explain that, yes, we operate work. It's not always fast, but nobody stops working. And we are a member of your relatives. Andre, uh, let's speak about coordinational staff uh, of POWs. We understand there is a big scope uh, of work for this staff for freeing our POWs. And uh, what is the situation right now? And how do you coordinate directly with the operations of uh, the representative of uh, Office of Commissioner? Good day, uh, Yusuf Andri, representative of uh, GUR and uh, uh, working group of uh, working with media. And uh, as everybody present here, and coordination uh, staff of uh, treating POWs, it's intra institution body created under order of the Chamber of Ministers. And uh, uh, the Commissioner Office uh, here, Agur, uh, Security Service uh, Ministry of uh, Reintegration, and all the other structures and bodies that are involved in the process of preparing to POW exchange and returning Ukrainian prisoners of war, and accompanying and providing them help, legal, social help to families of defenders and communication with the relatives, indubitably. And uh, there is active coordination with uh, authorized uh, our commissioner and uh, with the ombudsman and region as well. For a month, uh, uh, NGO office was operating for for civilians, where civilians can address. That's Kiev, Volis, uh, Spaska 37. And it's open to receive uh, applications of civilians for for relatives or fire defenders. I can dial uh, telephone uh, 074 uh, 1209 You can call and make an appointment. Also, there's uh, 095 412 uh, 7424. That's also the hotline. So, uh, just for us to understand, when do people need to uh, contact this contact center and when do they need to uh, contact the representative of the office? Or does, should they contact both? Well, these uh, phone numbers are not just uh, call centers. Uh, these are consultation numbers, so the relatives uh, of the defenders uh, can get support, including the legal support. We have memorandums of understanding about uh, the lawyer services in the country, and also such support is coordinated outside the country. And generally, there is a algorithm, as uh, was mentioned before. You should contact the National Police and the uh, Information Bureau. You can contact the uh, office uh, of uh, uh, the uh, Ombudsman directly, or you can uh, contact the contact person in our working group. So we work in a coordinated manner, and in every case, uh, the mechanism is arranged to support you. So over this month, uh, uh, there were uh, 5,500 uh, requests for information about the defenders of Ukraine. We were doing this together with the National Information Bureau, and uh, uh, their representatives are also included in our working group. So. Our contact center is um, a kind of a hub where we have everything for a person to get the necessary information and support. Also, over 1,500 uh, consultations were provided over the uh, phone, uh, and over 200 people got legal support. Surely, uh, this will gain traction and. Uh, not only the relatives uh, the, of the defenders and their unions, uh, we uh, actually uh, want to invite all the organizations involved in this, uh, involved with the 
Ukrainian prisoners of war uh, and uh, their relatives uh, since uh, the very beginning, since 2014. Let us work together. Let us uh, collaborate in different areas to get any kind of information or provide any kind of support for setting those uh, people free and uh, also including the support of the families. But uh, also we can work together to prevent uh, some negative activities. Uh, there are many anonymous initiatives, uh, channels, etc. right now to collect the data of the defenders and their relatives and uh, the majority of them uh, are the operations of the enemy. Sometimes people participate in that unconsciously, so we can provide explanations on that. That we can uh, raise awareness uh, and uh, work together against uh, this. So we are interested to have this done together with the civil society. We are open for this work. We uh, can arrange a working meeting and discuss uh, all the other details of our collaboration. So the processes are going on, the negotiations, the preparations for the exchange. We do understand that uh, this is a difficult thing to deal uh, with uh, such a party which neglects all the international law, but we are doing our best to bring the defenders back home. Thank you. We actually uh, have expected of this meeting that we uh, would outline the problem and uh, provide proposals on how to coordinate our efforts and uh, to work together. So for sure, we are ready to discuss this and to decide on the format in which to continue this work. So, dear colleagues, we understand that uh, the coordinating headquarter uh, and uh, the uh, uh, office uh, of the ombudsperson, they are uh, tasked to bring our defenders back home. But after they are home, it's uh, probably the uh, minister, Ministry of the Veterans uh, that uh, has to do a lot of work to make sure that uh, these people who are coming back, get the proper support, the support they need. Let us discuss this uh, with uh, Ruslan uh, from the Ministry of Veterans. So what kind of work is underway or being planned for uh, such uh, um, veterans? Hello, I'm Ruslan Prekhodko, the director of the directorate in the Ministry of Veterans. So we uh, have noticed that uh, previously there was uh, no uh, uh, policy uh, for the veterans uh, uh, back in 2013. So this uh, policy was being established uh, uh, over the past years. And now, since February 24, we have faced a new reality. Uh, it has to do not only with the persons directly taking part uh, in the uh, hostilities, but for the entire country. Uh, you know, there is an issue to provide housing and other social benefits to the defenders. It was a problem before February 24, but right now we understand that there is a huge number of IDPs, uh, people who were impacted uh, by the war, people whose property, uh, whose housing was damaged or destroyed in the war, uh, people who had to flee with uh, just one backpack. And so right now there is a big uh, challenge uh, in the country. And as a part of this challenge, we have lots of new tasks. We understand that there is a much higher number of people involved in the defense of our country. So the social challenges are entirely different now. Uh, when it comes to uh, this work with uh, people uh, coming uh, back uh, from being imprisoned or people who got uh, some injuries, uh, concussions in the war, and also the families of those who perished at the war, we analyzed the experience of other countries uh, in terms of rehabilitation of uh, uh, persons who were imprisoned by the enemy. We were looking for uh, the best uh, practices uh, that uh, could be somehow implemented uh, here in Ukraine. But uh, the experience we are undergoing right now, this is something unprecedented in Europe. 
That's a huge challenge, and we understand that this is a priority task for the Ministry of uh, Reintegration and for our ministry as well, working with these people who had been imprisoned by uh, the enemy and uh, came back. We understand that uh, this is a traumatic event, uh, not only for the person, but also for their family. So we are developing the first uh, pilots and uh, getting ready to launch them. Uh, quite soon, uh, I will be ready to announce uh, this information in more detail. We are right now establishing the teams of psychologists. We are uh, allocating uh, some uh, financing for this uh, with support of international partners who are ready to participate in this. We saw situations uh, when uh, the uh, families of uh, Azovstal defenders were traveling all around Europe, and we saw that many people uh, were ready to uh, participate in uh, helping them. So the uh, uh, civil sector is also getting involved uh, very actively, and uh, quite soon we will uh, arrive at a certain system of uh, synergy between the government and uh, civil sector. So uh, as for your second question, it's very important as well. We are facing the situation uh, where uh, some people actually die at war. We have to take care of uh, their status, and so we are uh, amending the uh, regulations to uh, streamline uh, the uh, uh, the uh, assigning of those statuses. Also, we uh, have um, different kinds of volunteer groups uh, that uh, were also taken part. Uh, in activities intended for the defense of the state, but again, legally they did not have the proper status, and in case uh, these people die or in case uh, these people are injured, we also need to have the procedures to uh, make sure that the proper status is assigned. So we are working with the committee uh, under the government of Ukraine. A draft law is developed, and it is right now being considered in the committee and um, thanks to this draft law it uh, will be possible to uh, uh, provide the proper status to such people so i i have two uh, questions uh, from the hubs the first question ruslan do you already have uh, the uh, sub law for the law uh, on social uh, status of uh, those set free uh, from the uh, imprisonment with the Russian Federation. So are there sub laws already? Is this law being put into action already? And the second question from the hubs, uh, will the commission uh, under the Ministry of uh, Veterans uh, consider uh, the issues of uh, payments for the uh, deceased? So, for instance, if uh, the parents live in other uh, countries uh, and the grandparents who are taking care of uh, their children, so will the commission be dealing with such uh, situations? Yeah, we'll start with this second question. So the uh, intersectoral commission um, right now is operating, and also there are uh, commissions in uh, different kinds uh, of uh, uh, law enforcement and military agencies. So in the future, on top of the issues that uh, the Commission has been dealing before, uh, right now there is a new uh, decree by the Cabinet of Ministers uh, is being considered for assigning the proper uh, status to the defenders. And uh, there will be some uh, mechanisms for providing the status to the volunteer groups. So it's the commission of uh, the general staff that will be uh, considering cases. And uh, we will be considering cases uh, in which the persons were not in the military at the moment when they were injured or died. And all the other related issues will be uh, considered by our commission. 
but we are an intersectoral commission, so we have representatives of every agency, and uh, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, for some time the commission did not uh, have its uh, meetings because uh, some of the members of the commission were directly involved in the defense tasks. Uh, right now we are uh, quickly working through the backlog of materials. So you mean the families uh, can contact you directly, the intersectoral commission? Yes, uh, but uh, I believe if uh, such cases are of any systematic nature, uh, there could be a joint meeting uh, with representatives of the civil society uh, and other stakeholders in this process, and we would uh, develop some solutions together. I personally am not uh, ready to tell about the numbers of uh, such cases as the example you are given. Yeah, our today's meeting is uh, about the cases which our veterans are facing. And there are such situations in the field. So for instance, uh, uh, w when they communicate with the relatives uh, of the deceased, there are such cases and so they are asking the questions. So we are indeed ready to have a separate meeting we are ready to uh, prepare the descriptions of uh, cases uh, for us to be able to develop the mechanisms. Yes, and coming back to your uh, first question, I'm not deeply involved in psychological rehabilitation, but uh, do you mean the persons uh, who were civilians or who were in the millions? Well, I, I know that you are dealing with the military. Yes, yes, so we uh, deal with the combatants and uh, we uh, uh, should uh, avoid uh, the uh, duplication of uh, duties uh, in the work of government institutions. So we uh, 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 only work with uh, the combatants and we uh, uh, do not do the work of uh, our uh, colleagues. Uh, okay, so Vladimir, a question to you. You are the first who uh, is involved in the communication of uh, the families of the uh, deceased or uh, persons gone missing. So what challenges do your units face and how can the civil society help? Thank you. I'm Volodymyr uh, Lamsin, representative uh, of uh, the general staff uh, of Ukraine. So uh, the communication with the civil society, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to mention that the armed forces uh, of Ukraine are always open for such communication and uh, constructive dialogue because all of us, uh, uh, those who are here, are working to arrive at the common goal, uh, which is uh, the victory over the aggressor state. And indeed, there are uh, challenges with communication. I will not delve deep into that. It's not exactly our unit uh, that is uh, always responsible for the first communication. In some areas, yes, but the main share of such communication with the families uh, of the deceased, of the present, of the uh, persons gone missing, uh, this, uh, are, this is a communication that is uh, happening uh, for uh, uh, happening through the uh, uh, centers uh, of enrollment, and uh, they are taking care of uh, all those uh, benefits, payments uh, for those who are still alive, uh, those who are unfortunately deceased or gone missing or prisoners of war. So there is a certain system in the Ministry of Defense. It does work. In some cases, uh, there is uh, this so-called human factor that uh, can hinder uh, the effect and operation of the system, which, but such cases are rare. And in terms of uh, communication with uh, the civil society and support of the armed forces in terms of uh, search for the person gone missing and also bringing back uh, the bodies of the deceased home, because as is, is it was mentioned, the war uh, is going to be over when every uh, soldier will be found and uh, also every soldier needs 
Altera name to be brought back. We want to avoid the situation where we have persons gone missing. So in total we had uh, 65 uh, uh, persons gone missing as of February 24th. Compare this to uh, the beginning of 2015 when we had hundreds of them. So this shows uh, how effective this work can be in the uh, armed forces of Ukraine. Unfortunately now these numbers are up again but the work is on and we uh, communicate in different structures. I personally participate in the uh, coordinating headquarters. We are indeed working together, undertaking activities, and so there is systematic work in the armed forces. When it comes to this uh, dialogue with uh, the society, maybe it's not the best example right now, but uh, I, I have the slides uh, somewhere, and so. Our communication with the civil society can be illustrated by the following. In mid-July, there was a broad discussion on social media of the initiatives of our uh, veterans about uh, the uh, inappropriate uh, use of uh, this um, also that uh, definition of uh, uh, load 200, uh, the, the expression that was used back in the Soviet Union. There are many explanations of how this title emerged. One of the versions is that uh, it, it was due to the aviation delivery of uh, the bodies uh, from uh, the other countries, so that this was uh, the total weight uh, of uh, the uh, coffin with the body, 200 kilograms. But we are a civilized country. We cannot treat our deceased as some kind of cargo. So uh, this is something that was discussed by the veterans on social media and uh, the uh, management of the armed forces and personally uh, the uh, I uh, had command uh, has, has paid attention to this and uh, now uh, of course every defender of uh, our country is first and foremost uh, uh, the person it's not some kind of statistics it's a real person who gave their life to defend our country for us to be able to have this conversation here uh, therefore the decision was uh, made to introduce a project uh, in the uh, armed forces uh, of Ukraine, uh, which is intended for the rebranding of the uh, specialized vehicles. I'm grateful to the support uh, of uh, civil society organizations that are supporting us in this, and we are establishing these new traditions. We want to avoid the situation when our defenders are just numbers. This is just one of the examples. And uh, with regards of uh in general, communication, because it's a sensitive topic, really sensitive topic regarding our uh, perished and grateful. There, there are many examples of certain, I don't I don't call them speculations, maybe expressions in the informational space, improper presentation of data, some focus on this topic, as Andre said, uh, the enemy Ipso uh, detachments, they d do it sometimes deliberately in our society. They emphasize these sensitive topics. As the representative armed forces of Ukraine, I can assure you that as, as armed forces, the state does everything possible to support, to provide uh, uh, help for our families of uh, and our defenders that are either perished or uh, POWs. Before the start of full-scale invasion, it worked, but uh, the scale was completely different. Therefore, yes, of course, they are gaps, so to speak, or we see our mistakes and we correct them and we develop and we 
we uh, ask you to please understand us as well because we cannot from scratch upscale it perfectly and speaking of law a little bit of international law there is a little comment as it was mentioned before Europe and Ukraine is a Euro European country for 70 years Europe have not seen the war as we have uh, with Russia it's since 2014 and the new stage of uh, this war started in uh, February this year therefore the views system in our state and international law and in Europe it changed a bit maybe the loss some reality on how this law has to apply in contemporary conditions of war therefore regarding all the views on international law and uh, rule of w rules of war we have to review our attitude just a recent report of one of the organizations where they actually blamed ukraine because they the, uh, some of those representatives they actually lost the sense of reality because as armed forces of Ukraine we have to do our job have to do our duty and we have no other way we will win in this war against aggressor and all the civil society of Ukraine have to believe in us and wait a bit we'll do our job as, as we have to and to help you of course all together I really want to thank uh, the first rotation was uh, uh, the civil uh, military cooperation because I'm, I'm their military family thank you for openness because our organizations our network of veteran space they also involved you or involved with the returning the perished and we coordinate with the civil military cooperation we don't act remotely independently we communicate with them since the start and this work is in our scope i thank you for this initiative this is very extremely important for all the ukrainian community because it's about dignity about dignity of our defenders about our dignity and a few more words about communication with ngos with uh, uh civilians who want to help us solving this important issue as delivering bodies of our uh, parish defenders home there's a series of legal documents of uh, the MOD that regulate that the commander of the military unit is responsible for each subordinate that perished to be delivered to the burial site final burial site and the commander has the right to address any organizations to any structures that can ensure proper uh, transportation of uh, the parish as uh, stipulated by the legislation. Sometimes they tr try to blame the armed forces that we absorb this activity, but it's not so. Everything that happens is this very ex important issue. It has to be coordinated clearly. There is a big list of NGOs that help armed forces to deliver bodies we try to coordinate them why because it's a military f not to say that to Dnipro where one of the big uh, uh, forensic expertise uh, institutions is two sp or three specialized uh, groups of armed forces move that will transport bodies of our uh, defenders home to Kharkiv, just seven representatives of uh, NGOs under their initiative, because parents address them or a commander address them. Just not to mix it all up. We ask you to coordinate and communicate with us, with armed forces, with our detachments that are involved with coordination. Why? To utilize the resource, all the resource that armed forces have, all the resource that our civil society has. All the organizations that are involved with this extremely important issue and complex issue to have an even uh, distribution of means and to make this work maximally efficient to avoid cases when somebody is has initiative but did not know 
the conditions of legislation, how, how it should be happening. And regretfully, we had cases when the delivered bodies of our defenders home, and then we had to bring it back to forensic expertise uh, institutions because there is an order, there is an algorithm stipulated by the legislation we, we, we are not allowed to break. And I address all to help to help our forces. We really appreciate your help, always. And we want to help you as well. But please understand that this system, as it's established by the state, it has to operate as a single mechanism aimed at reaching certain result. Thank you. Uh, Olga, uh, I would like to give you the floor uh, as an expert on uh, law of, in wartime. You face many cases. Let's speak about them. Thank you, thank you very much. I think everybody who is uh, watching us or listening to us, they understand the contest, context and the scope of problems uh, for Ukrainian state and for civil society of Ukraine. My name is Olga Shatilov, uh, and I'm coordinator of Media Initiative uh, for Human Rights. It's the organization that was created in 2016 by journalists that since 2014 were adjacent to investigations of violation of human rights related to uh, military aggression of Russian Federation. And uh, we continue those operations. We investigate also location of civil uh, captives, uh, POWs uh, also. We register war crimes in the combat area. We wrote a lot of work. We analyze uh, while lawyers work with us and we give that to the national investigators bodies. And uh, speaking of uh, mechanisms that are aimed at uh, making criminals responsible, that's International Criminal Court, specially co uh, created commission of under the UN on investigation that operates in Ukraine, also the uh, uh, Moscow mechanism of the OSC, and we hope they will be involved to investigations of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. But today, I would like to really focus on our cooperation with the state bodies and firstly I would like to thank the organizers it's really important that we gathered all here together and that the authority of representatives they express their willingness to cooperate because we since 2016 and before we observed this sometimes I would say post Soviet practice pardon me that the authority just shut themselves from uh, the civil society or per perceive civil society as opponents or uh, perceive critic uh, of civil society from civil society as something hostile. We will operate, as you mentioned, we work on the single goal and uh, if sometimes we criticize the state bodies it's just to help uh, emphasize the problem, not, not to hinder your work. And, uh, now, when we try to uh, question relatives of uh, captives or, or to, uh, trying to help, uh, pretty often we face that investigators or representatives of the Secret Service, they recommend relatives not to talk to civil societies, not give them information. And I think it's really wrong because sometimes uh, uh, the civil society has uh, more trust to NGOs and we have tools that the state cannot use and we could be of use to you. Uh, sometimes we have just more opportunities because we have less problems than uh, the state faces and we can in some case we can focus more in some case and investigate speaking of a civil, a civil captive or a POW uh, where the person is located to question people a precise case who saw that person who uh, was in the same cell with that person, who was on the stage when they, that person was transferred. So we actually focus on details and we investigate and uh, we actually need your trust on this. It's clear because there are many crooks as well now. But they are reliable NGOs as well. Like, well, they're well known that right now in the coalition of Ukraine, no, there are 30 NGOs that uh, register war crimes and they're all reliable and checked NGOs that you can really trust and you, 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 you can give them contacts and you can uh, talk of, uh, to the relatives of uh, uh, that they, they don't shut from us. 
So this coordination is really extremely important. And uh, also we can help the state that from objective or subjective reasons cannot ensure full communication with a lot of relatives of uh, uh, perished of POWs. We elaborated uh, on the British model with concept of communication with help of uh, Glenn Grant, uh, who is a military expert of uh, the UK. Communication with families. Communication of losses, so to speak, with relatives. Regretfully, the centers of social support that were created, they pretty often cannot manage this work. Sometimes because they have no trained specialists, that they lack them. Sometimes they just don't have enough info. And here it's very important to involve that communication the relatives. We speak that we could create, I can call it, so to speak, parent committee, the union of relatives under each military unit, that would ease the communication with them. You, you would not need to each family member of a missing person to, they would not need to call the commander 10 times a day and increase pressure on that commander and on staff of uh, military units and uh, on the uh, conscription offices as well. So uh, the our concepts is uh, how to implement that and we are willing to assist that uh, in, in implementation of that concept and to involve with that as well. It's really important. More than that, there are veteran spaces, veteran offices, there are vets who are willing to in, be involved with that work. And what we need, we need more trust and openness and to involve civil society more. We clearly understand the scope of work, the huge scope of work that each one of you faces. And we're willing to, uh, to help and we greet the coordination staff, the coordination staff creation. Because before that, uh, it was nine circles of hell for relatives re to repeat the same thing to different institutions, and it's psychologically extremely important, for, uh, extremely uh, difficult for the relatives. So I just greet this initiative. It's it's very good, and uh, the issue of Andre uh, on creating working group or as minimum to conduct uh, working sessions. Our NGOs and our media initiative uh, for human rights in coalition of. Uh, uh, Ukraine at 5 a.m. Uh, we are w r willing to help and we're willing to share information and to coordinate with you. The only request is to give us more trust and more. B please be more open with us. Thank you, Alena Let's speak about the defining categories of people that uh, suffer due to Russian aggression. So please, for yours. Thank you for your question, Alena Center of uh, Human Rights, Mina. We're also co uh, part of coalition uh, Ukraine at 5 a.m. We're joined of, uh, to question of uh, documenting uh, war crimes uh, during Russian aggression and to certain solutions that could uh, improve the investigations and to improve lives of people who suffer from war. The people who suffer from uh, the victims of war uh, is very topical because in Ukraine still, we're in the ninth year of war, we still have no single approach who is a victim of uh, uh, armed aggression of Russian Federation. Oksana started properly that war is people, it's about people. And it's not only about people that defend the country, it's not only about the uh, relatives of defenders, but about civilians, about civilians that suffer from war. Prior 24th of February, prior to the full-scale invasion of Russia on uh, our territory, we were speaking that the state defined uh, victims of war as certain categories of people. So uh, the state defined categories and certain ways to defend those people. It happened with persons that uh, or, uh, had crimes against their freedom, or their civilians and POWs. Uh, missing people uh, under certain circumstances, a huge category as IDPs. Uh, so state approaches were such that let's pick a category they're not very numerous usually, and let's speak about what how state can support those categories of people. As Alex were speaking about his work, their work, and relatives of uh, missing people under such special circumstances, if it's defined that the person is missing actually, uh, in terms of war, of the occupation, they uh, have the right, their relatives, to, for state support. And the state just works with the categories. And since February 4th, situation had to change. 
it would have to be the same approach to defining what category of people could be considered victims of war. Due to high numbers of victims of war, we're speaking about we're speaking millions of IDPs now. A few months we were speak ago we were speaking eight millions, and we don't know how many mi millions will be evacuated from uh, 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 territories that are occupied by Russian Federation now, and how may, much more IDPs we'll have. So we're speaking about which uh, people are victims of co conflict, and to create uh, transparent criteria. And which is really important that all the persons that are victims that need to be defended and their rights have to be renewed and uh, the losses have to be compensated and to expect the Russian Federation to do it is, we, we shouldn't on this stage but the, they will compensate in due time and the international partners would be willing to provide the support and su uh, support the victims uh, but here, uh, it's our initiative, it has to be our initiative, initiative of Ukraine. We have to create a clear understanding, clear definition of victims and uh, criteria, and study their needs in order to have an opportunity to make a request to international partners asking to provide certain aid. It's relevant to cer uh, certain victims of war crimes, like victims of sexual violence uh, in conditions of war conflict, victims whose uh, property or whose housing was damaged or destroyed, uh, wounded uh, at war. So the state now has to take that duty and form this state approach. And I think the start, the initiation of the process has happened already. As you know, the state started, initiated this ambitious plan of renewing Ukraine from the consequences of war. And in this plan, there is a uh, part of uh, human rights def uh, and has a block of defining the victims of war. So I hope the Council on Renewal of Ukraine will support the plan and it will in detail provide how this, what will be the responsibility of the state to define the victims of war. And I would like to reiterate that we have no examples to look at. We cannot cut and paste the approaches because in the international law, there is no single definition of victim of armed conflict, just several categories of uh, humanitarian right, national humanitarian right, but it's just about the course of war. So during the course of war, they are defended persons, those who suffer from the conflict, they are victims of armed war conflict, but we're not interested in only international humanitarian right, but also the issues of renewal of human rights when people are in the situation of armed conflict during combat or and after combat suffering certain damages or wounds they have the right for certain status and for guarantees of additional needs unfortunately we have uh, just one example when the government was uh, discussing the special status for a child uh, that uh, was uh, a victim of war but uh, we actually have the status but it, it does not uh, provide any uh, additional guarantees so we have to clearly define the categories and the mechanisms for protection of such persons and with this list we uh, can contact the international partners who are ready to support our civilians but they uh, need to understand the approach of the government and also we have two other speakers joining us uh, online and while uh, they are connecting uh, I also would like to mention the compensations for destroyed property uh, so uh, this uh, issue was very frequent in Mikolaev and uh, uh, partially there there is a response to that there is a national uh, program being developed and the mechanisms are going to develop afterwards yes uh, so there are several uh, legislative initiatives uh, that uh, have to do with the compensations but uh, all of them are on hold right now because when we have no budget for the compensation, the government uh, cannot take on any uh, obligations it will not be able to fulfill. So we are right now at the stage of 
collecting information about the destroyed or damaged uh, property for some uh, time it was done through the D application maybe this mechanism is still there but uh, we are right now uh, computing the scope of the compensation and what about the compensation for the people who have uh, restored uh, their property uh, using their own uh, funds, uh, their own money. So in European, for instance, we are not waiting for the international support. People are doing things on their own. So there are several legal initiatives. For sure, there should be some compensation for uh, the money people have spent already, but we don't know the details yet. Uh, in the east of Ukraine, there was such opportunity uh, till the 24th of February, but right now, since we don't even know about the scopes, uh, it's it's very difficult to speak of the detail. And also there is a decree by the Cabinet of Ministers. Right now, the needs are being collected, and all of us were providing our proposals on the uh, priorities of uh, different categories. Uh, who will get the compensations first for uh, the destroyed or damaged property. These categories include uh, veterans and uh, uh, families of the deceased. But uh, right now, the first thing we need to know is uh, the total amount of uh, funds that's necessary based uh, on the amount we will be able to uh, look for uh, the sources and uh, these are huge amounts and also we still have active uh, hostilities there are bombs uh, there are missile attacks and yeah there is a number of uh, projects intended to provide house into our people but we also see uh, the needs of people uh, growing and uh, it will be very difficult for the government to uh, find such amounts and also the government has already had obligations before february 24th uh, so you know it's it's very difficult to provide uh, funds if we know that uh, the house we built can be destroyed uh, tomorrow by the missiles so, thank you so much. And here we have Daria Sveridova with us. Uh, I do hope that Daria has uh, heard our conversation before. So let us discuss in more detail the documenting of the war crimes. Hello, hello, dear colleagues. Yes, I heard your conversation. I'm very grateful to uh, the organizers for this important subject and for the communication with the veteran community. I'm one of the experts uh, taking part uh, in the Ukraine 5 a.m. coalition and one of the important tasks of the coalition uh, is to uh, provide uh, documenting of the numerous war crimes uh, that are being committed right now as a part of uh, armed aggression uh, by the Russian Federation. And one of the important uh, elements of uh, uh, mitigating uh, the consequences and restoring the rights of the victims is this important element uh, with which I've been involved directly since 2013. Uh, this area is access of victims to justice uh, and uh, defining the person's uh, uh, guilty, uh, no matter how much time has passed. So this work is done in two big tracks, one of which is the national and uh, the second one is international. So I will focus on the second one because this work of Ukraine in order to protect uh, the rights of the state and the citizens and uh, ensuring the uh, compensation for uh, the losses uh, incurred uh, on the international level uh, it is one of the best examples of uh, a high quality legal 
battlefield that uh, will help us uh, ensure uh, recording the crimes uh, committed by the Russian Federation, but not limiting uh, ourselves to some uh, political declarations about the uh, support of Ukraine by the international community, but also uh, the uh, recognition of uh, the crimes in the jurisdictions recognized by every civilized country. And I believe uh, this work is no less important uh, than uh, finding the political support and the numerous uh, political resolutions that we are uh, getting in the diplomatic space. So uh, this uh, war is uh, here uh, since uh, February 2014. Uh, since then, Ukraine has uh, contacted in over uh, 10 uh, occasions when, when these cases were initiated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So uh, this were, um, uh, this were addresses to the international courts of justice and also uh, the prosecutor's office with the non-governmental organizations uh, have contacted the international prosecutors. If you are interested uh, in a more detail, detailed information, you can find it in the special uh, website uh, created by the Ministry of uh, Justice, uh, which represent this legal component of uh, our war. But let us focus on what was done since uh, February 24th because of the uh, crimes committed by the Russian Federation in this year. So uh, since the beginning of uh, the aggression in this year, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has contacted the UN International Court. It is a case against uh, the Russian Federation. And uh, uh, this is a crime under convention uh, on the prevention of genocide. And uh, uh, this uh, case is based on the uh, propaganda, um, ungrounded propaganda statements by the Russian uh, Federation, claiming that they were forced to protect the population of uh, Ukraine from the genocide uh, purportedly uh, perpetrated by the government of Ukraine. So uh, this was the reason why this case was filed to uh, the International Institution of Justice and uh, hopefully it will give the proper assessment to these actions of the Russian Federation and uh, trying to justify uh, their actions by some purported genocide uh, of Ukraine. So if uh, this case, we surely understand that it will take uh, some time for the case to be fully considered, uh, but uh, we could see in March uh, this year uh, the decision was made about uh, some temporary measures against the uh, Russian Federation um, under the convention that I was uh, mentioning before. Uh, there was uh, an address calling Russia to stop uh, the aggression and uh, the combat operations. And we all understand that the aggressor state is systematically ignoring such rulings of the international courts, but from the legal standpoint, they are very important. They are important for documenting the illicit activities of the Russian Federation and its top officials. Also, other uh, work is underway with uh, the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, although we have not uh, ratified the uh, uh, Rome status, but uh, uh, Ukraine has agreed for the jurisdiction of this court a couple of uh, years ago. And uh, also it uh, has expressed consent for the investigation of crimes by this court back at the end of 2013. 
So it's very important to understand that uh, this court will be uh, considering uh, the possibility of uh, cases of uh, genocide, uh, crimes against humanity uh, by uh, persons, um, specifically um, citizens of the Russian Federation. And uh, this will be a criminal responsibility imposed on specific persons, uh, unlike in the uh, uh, previous case I discussed. So uh, this, I believe, will be first and foremost top officials of uh, the Russian Federation that have to do with these uh, systematic crimes committed in our territory. And unlike in the previous uh, years where the investigation has uh, not been started. Uh, the uh, basically were considering uh, the evidence provided by Ukraine. Uh, this year, however, uh, as initiated by 39 organizations, uh, the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has uh, initiated the investigation and has been to Ukraine several times with the purpose of uh, investigating these international crimes committed in Ukraine and which has grown in scale since February this year. So uh, the um, charges are not there yet, but the investigation has started and that's a very important step on, on the part of uh, the uh, international prosecutor. And one more important institution involved here uh, that uh, has uh, already made the first rulings, uh, this is the European uh, Court of Human Rights. On numerous occasions we have uh, uh, filed cases about violations uh, of human rights by the Russian Federation. So this, these are the cases against uh, the Russian Federation. And the crimes have to do with violations uh, since 2013. In February this year, uh, the uh, uh, Ministry of Justice uh, has uh, filed a case once again uh, uh, about the uh, mm, a violation of the right to uh, life, uh, about the uh, uh, ban on um, uh, the uh, illicit uh, imprisonment uh, of persons, uh, the ban on torture, uh, the right to uh, freedom of speech and expression, uh, uh, the uh, uh, right for uh, peaceful associations in the uh, uh, citizen towns occupied by the Russian Federation. Also the uh, uh, destruction of property by the Russian Federation. So there were numerous uh, violations of human rights uh, that uh, were filed in this case by uh, Ukraine. So the court has received uh, all the materials and has uh, uh, informed uh, the Russian Federation about the case. So, if uh, uh, you know these courts have already uh, received uh, the cases filed by Ukraine, uh, well, the work is uh, underway, and also Ukraine has uh, initiated new legal platforms which uh, can be established and uh, Ukraine is currently working for them to be established to make sure that uh, uh, its citizens are protected. So there are two uh, quite serious uh, initiatives. The first one uh, being the work of the office of uh, the president together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in order to establish a special uh, tribunal on aggression against Ukraine. So uh, there is only one uh, similar case in history, the Nuremberg and uh, Tokyo tribunals, which were established by several states um, as a consequence of uh, crimes committed uh, during World War II. So we are pressed on time, Director. Please be very brief about these initiatives. Yes, and the second initiative is uh, the commission uh, 
on which also the Office of the President and the Ministry of Justice are working right now. It's a compensation mechanism that is uh, being developed by uh, our uh, country and uh, communicated to our partners. If it is established, it will be possible to uh, compensate for uh, the damage uh, of property uh, using the uh, property uh, of the Russian Federation that is right now under sanctions. And we do understand that uh, the work of international organizations is uh, slow. Uh, for sure, it's very important in this work uh, to make the contribution, and the contribution of every one of us is important. I uh, do support the idea that all of this work is being done for the people. And in the international courts, it's very important to have uh, the cases uh, timely and comprehensively documented with the eyewitness accounts who will uh, later be available uh, to take part in the court processes. So I do hope that this work that's underway right now, the work by the government and the civil society, will contribute to the development of the national mechanisms for the protection of victims and building the trust uh, for us to have the basis for work with uh, international uh, court institutions, to have the possibility to report about the crimes uh, committed and to uh, get uh, uh, the, the persons uh, held responsible in case uh, of uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in our territory. So thank you. And also we have uh, Nadia with us. We will uh, request Nadia Volkova to be very brief. Nadia, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. So yeah, we, we, we are pressed on time, but uh, uh, our next event is, is going to take place very soon, but I know that your message is important. Yes, I've been listening to all of you very attentively, and uh, actually it's the advantage of the last speaker, because I could have heard many important uh, ideas today, so I can summarize briefly that, yes, I agree with the previous speakers and uh, my thoughts and feelings, uh, the feelings of the person who is in Ukraine right now is that, yes, the challenges are numerous. We've always had them and after the beginning of this full-scale invasion, uh, these uh, challenges have increased uh, in scope dramatically and it's a huge tragedy, uh, it's a huge uh, grief here in Ukraine, but also uh, it's a, a new chance for development if we truly overcome these challenges. Uh, this is what we call life, because without moving forward, without searching for effective solutions, we will not be able to keep on living. Therefore, all the initiatives that were discussed here today, and our initiative uh, as well, um, you know, we are dealing with developing the capacity of the Ukrainian justice system since 2015, uh, specifically in the issues uh, related to the armed conflicts. So there are many challenges, many problems. Uh, but I know that we are pressed on time. So uh, just like Ruslan has mentioned and uh, Volodymyr has mentioned before, there is uh, unfortunately uh, as, as Ukraine has demonstrated to the world, uh, there is uh, a no uh, ready-made solution. We are working between the national and international levels, uh, finding the opportunities in the existing just in justice system, but uh, actually this system uh, does not uh, meet uh, the requirements uh, of uh, the current situation. So it depends on us to rebuild what's there uh, right now for the benefit of Ukrainians, uh, but also for the benefit of the entire world. So I do hope we succeed in this, and I hope that through our collaboration and mutual support, we will arrive at the best result. Thank you, Nadia. And, uh I will wrap up on uh, that one decision is regarding coordination today. 
the current condition of our working meeting and further on I hope uh, we work in format of our cooperation because I know that uh, how uh, NGO can be efficient and our sector can be efficient how, and how efficient our co uh, cooperation with this state sector could be uh, because uh, many of, of uh, my partners are here and I think the decision is very expected and prognosed and it's correct for us and I do believe that we will keep informing people that we work for uh, via our partners, via our NGOs and regions that the state and the uh, uh, and the civil society sectors what we do to overcome the consequences of war and to support people who suffer from war and I want to thank everybody all the speakers thank you for being here with us today thank you for gathering today it's a victory for Ukraine when we are all united and we're invincible when we're united uh, uh, dear journalists that uh, were with us here together I apologize for not providing the opportunity to ask questions, but I think our speakers will be uh, glad to uh, uh, answer questions after the event and give you comments, if any, if you have any comments. Thank you once again, and I remind you that next event will be in five, seven minutes. So, thank you.